I now come to a, a session I've been looking forward to all day, which is free market environmentalism. Now, I would dare to say that, in the minds of most people, that the case for free market environmentalism has been depicted by the critically acclaimed Kevin Costner movie, Waterworld. Um, now, the great environmental scholar, Al Gore, uh, who incidentally created the internet, as you know, would most certainly agree with this view and the role for government to intervene on behalf of the environment at his great personal profit. So this is a topic that I believe libertarianism has a lot to say on, and who better to say it than our keynote speaker, Professor Walter Block. I was uh, once in a debate with a, a guy over free market environmentalism. I think he was a biologist or a chemist or some, something like that. And he didn't know what free market environmentalism and, and after about 10 minutes when he understood what it was, he burst out laughing. He just burst out laughing and it wasn't a ploy. It was, this was honest laughter. I mean, the idea that the free market could help the environment was so antithetical to his thinking that, that he just burst out laughing. It was the most amazing thing. Uh, I, I think I could tell if, if he were just purposely doing it in order to put me down. He wasn't. He, he really didn't understand that. And a lot of people think that the free market and environmentalism are polar opposites. And if you favor the one, you have to oppose the other. And if you favor the other, you have to oppose the one. I don't think it's true. I think that um, free market environmentalism is not a contradiction in terms. I think it's uh, something not only good, but better than any other alternative, uh, certainly better than the, the watermelon alternative. And the reason I call uh, the critics of the market watermelons is because they're green on the outside and red on the inside. <laughs> I mean, there are some people who just love to run other people's lives. And they had it pretty good for a while, up until about 1991 when the Soviet Union went kaplooey and uh, 1989 when the uh, Berlin Wall fell. Uh, things were going pretty good for them. You know, Marxism was uh, cool on the campuses and you can get dates with girls if you were a Marxist and all that. Uh, and then it just fell apart and they had to come up with something else. So they hitched their wagon to the environment. Uh, it's a, I applaud them for it. I mean, it, it's a good intervention. It, it's almost as good as socialism, or maybe better than socialism. I'm not sure about that. I take the view that if we adhere to private property rights, we will help the environment. And the reason that the environment is uh, going to hell in a handbasket is because we're not adhering to uh, private property rights. And what I'm going to do is illustrate this with um, four or five issues. I've got pollution, species extinction, uh, the paper plastic problem, overpopulation, and trees. Uh, I don't think that that covers the waterfront. There are other issues. Um, uh, there's environmental racism. There's, um, uh, what do you call it, a global warming, and a uh, um, whole, bu whole bunch of other things. And maybe we can get to some of them in the question period. OK, let's talk about pollution. Now, this is a, an example that mainstream economists love to use as a case of market failure. And they have a supply and demand curve. And they show that the real cost curve of uh, producing a podium like this is uh, not just the wood or the plastic or the lumber or the insurance that went into it, but also the fact that when you make it, what you do is you uh, hoist pollutants onto the property of other people. And they call that a, an externality or a negative externality or an external diseconomy. Let me tell you a story. Once upon a time, long, long ago, all stories have to start that way. In the 1830s or 1840s in the US, again, I don't know what happened in Australia or other countries. I get this from Murray Rothbard and a guy named Morton Horowitz, H-O-R-W-I-T-Z, who was a Harvard historian of the mid 19th century. What you'd have was a little old lady, hate to be sexist about it, but I am, uh, who would hang out her washing, this is in the days before the uh, electronic uh, dryer, and uh, she'd hang up her washing and it would be wet and clean and she'd come back two hours later and it was dry and dirty. And she'd go to the court and she'd say, that there factory two miles down the street, it put pollutants onto my laundry and I want two things, I want an injunction which means a, a ruling by the court that they cut it out, and I also want damages, they ruined my laundry. And in many cases, 
the court would agree. Not all cases, but in some cases, the court would agree. Or you'd get a case of a farmer who'd go to court and say, I uh, had a haystacks, and the railroad came by with uh, sparks 300 feet in the air, and it got my haystacks on fire, even though they were on my private property, and I want damages and an injunction. And again, sometimes, uh, many times, the courts would approve of this. These, uh, we, what they were called then was nuisance lawsuits, but uh, we would now call them environmental lawsuits. And the fact that the courts upheld private property rights had several benevolent effects. First of all, uh, entrepreneurs, businessmen, were led by Adam Smith's invisible hand to uh, use more expensive anthracite coal rather than clean, uh, rather than dirty but cheaper sulfur coal. Because if they used sulfur coal, they would get uh, little old ladies on, on their case. There was even some environmental forensics in those days. You know what forensics is? You know, they have all these CSI shows where they were interested in blood and semen and hair particles and uh, what's under your fingernails to figure out who the rapist or the murderer was. Well, you had environmental forensics. Here's a dust particle. Where did it come from? Let's go get them and get damages and an injunction against them. And you had incentives when you had a smokestack to put a, a mesh in the smokestack to catch most of the dust that would get out and then every once in a while you change the, 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 the mesh, M-E-S-H, and things were pretty good. Not perfect. Uh, there is such a thing uh, called um, um, de minimis. We all exhale. We all exhale a, a, a poison, carbon dioxide. What are we going to do? Say you can't exhale uh, carbon dioxide? That's silly. Every industrial product has some sort of a little bit of pollution. I mean, if you need an oxygen tent, don't go to move to Pittsburgh because you know, you're gonna get something even though uh, you can sue them if they do these pollution uh, type activities. Well, then came the progressive period in the, 19, in the 1870s through about 1910. And uh, during the progressive period, a new philosophy overcame the courts in the US. And the philosophy was, we gotta be number one. <clears throat> Who was number one then? Great Britain. How do you become number one? You get battleships, cruisers, tanks, guns, things like that. So the next time this little old lady or this farmer came into court in the 1890s, the court said, yeah, yeah, they're violating your private property rights. You're stinking, lousy, selfish private property rights. There's something more important than private property rights, and that's the public good. And what does the public good consist of? The public good consists of letting manufacturers uh, you trespass their dust particles onto your property. Well, if that's the way the law is going to be, if you were a green businessman, uh, a Christian, uh, somebody who didn't want to pollute other people, who wanted to use more expensive anthracite coal, who wanted to uh, take steps to keep pollution to yourself, you would be at a competitive disadvantage vis-a-vis uh, -vis the other people who had no, no such niceties, and they would drive you out of business, assuming equal uh, ceteris paribus, uh, other equal abilities. So now, the law system was working in a very perverse way. And uh, there was the, Murray Rothbard quotes some Georgia State uh, Court, the uh, Supreme Court of Georgia, saying that, did I say something wrong? <laughs> okay. Uh, the Georgia Supreme Court said something to the effect that pollution uh, is, legitimate. You, uh, it's legal. You can't stop pollution. Well, if you have that kind of a legal system, of course you're going to have pollution. And then uh, things got pretty bad in the 19, mid 20th century, and then they had to come up with the EPA. But the, the problem was created in the first place by the courts not upholding property rights. Um, one argument against this is, well, what are you going to do? Sue every automobile owner? Uh, for pollutants, and you have to, I don't know how many automobile owners there are in Australia or the US, but there are plenty of them, and, and it would be um, unfeasible to sue each and every one of them, and also each and every one of them only contributes this much, namely de minimis amount of pollution, so it wouldn't work, and Murray Rothbard's answer to that was, well, if we had private highways, a point that I'll get to in my lecture tomorrow, then you wouldn't have to sue each automobile owner. What you would do is sue the highway, the private highway, for running a body house of pollution or something like that. And, and then the owner of the road would turn around to his customers and say, look, you can ride without a catalytic uh, converter. 
you can uh, pollute a lot, but we're going to charge you 10 times as much. So the market would then work toward reducing pollution. Uh, and then they have to have the EPA, which comes up with all sorts of uh, problems about you know, how big your toilet bowl can be and, and all sorts of stuff like that. But the, the, the cause of pollution is not the free enterprise private property rights system. The cause of it is the very abnegation of this. OK, so that's enough on pollution, a few minutes on each. Uh, the next one I'll do is um, species extinction. Uh, there was this guy, Daniel Arap Moy, from somewhere in Africa. I get all those African countries, Kenya. And what he did is he burned a million and a half dollars worth of ivory. And it was on the front cover of Time or Newsweek or one of those um, things. And he was doing this as a protest against hunting elephants. And there's this thing called CITES, C-I-T-E-S, Convention on International Traffic. I don't know how, I'm not sure what it stands for. But the idea is you can't have trade in elephant tusks and uh, rhinoceros uh, horns or anything like that. And it's a way to try to preserve these animals. The reason we have species extinction is not because of capitalism or greed or private property or profits. It's because of the, uh, the, the thing called in economics the tragedy of the commons. What's the tragedy of the commons? Tragedy of the commons is if everyone owns something or really no one owns something, then no one has, excuse me, any uh, incentive to uphold it. Look, suppose I gave you each a can of Coke and unbeknownst to you there was a monitor in it monitoring how quickly you slurped it up. And you would uh, take your time because no one else could get it. It's your can of Coke, and uh, you, you'll save a little bit for later on. But if we had a communal can of Coke, forget about the sanitariness of it, and long straws, then each of you would slurp it up quick because if you didn't, then the other guy would grab your share, and we would dissipate the resource much more quickly if we had a tragedy of the commons. Well, as far as I'm concerned, the cow and the buffalo are the same animal. I know there are biological differences. Don't bother me with that. They're the same animal. They both have horns. They're both big and fat. If you crash into one of them, you're in trouble. They give milk, I think. I don't know. They run around like meshuganas in Yiddish. You know, they're, they're just uh, the same animal. Why is it that the cow never came within a million miles of extinction and the buffalo almost did? There was this horrible movie with uh, Kevin Costner, the, the Dances with Wolves. I, it's just horrible pinko crap. <laughs> You know, the, the white man is going to kill all the buffalo. We've got to kill the white man. I mean, it's just horrible stuff. Why is it? The reason is because the, if you shoot a cow the, or you slaughter a cow, the opportunity costs of that are pretty high. Namely, you don't have a cow tomorrow. So you think carefully, should you slaughter a cow or not? But the buffalo, they just run by. You can't own them or you couldn't own them in those days and if you shot one the opportunity or alternative cost of it was zero because you wouldn't have it anyway somebody else would have it so you might as well shoot it. So the reason that the, the buffalo went extinct and the cow didn't even though they're the same animal in, in some sense is because one was privately owned and the other wasn't. Well as far as I'm concerned the elephant is just a cow with big ears and a funny looking nose. It's the same thing. What you need is barnyardization of elephants. OK, the, the fences will have to be a little thicker, and maybe you'll have to electronically do it, and you can't do two acres. They need a little bit more room to run, run around in. Botswana, the, the country in Africa, is the closest to privatization of elephants. They're not quite there, but they allow uh, people to take advantage of owning elephants. And the herds there increase, whereas elsewhere in Africa, the herds decrease. Look, if I own a herd of elephants, would I allow you to shoot a young female pregnant elephant? Yes, but you're going to have to pay a lot more. A lot, lot more than if you shoot a, a male uh, elephant past the ages of whatever, or, or any male elephant, given that the uh, limitation on uh, new baby elephants is females, not males. It's no accident that the farmer keeps one bull and 50 cows, not 50 bulls and one cow. The 49 bulls would be superfluous. So if I own elephant herd or if I own a buffalo herd, and now some places in the US they are allowed to own buffalo, well then there's no more uh, species extinction problem. And it's the same thing with, um, I always get crocodiles and alligators mixed up. Crocodile Dundee, right? Uh, 
Well, there was a time when they were going uh, extinct also, and then they allowed them to be owned. The reason they were going extinct is they weren't allowing private property rights. So this is yet another example of where the market and private property rights promotes the environment and doesn't undermine it. Let me take uh, the plastic, paper, recycling, reusing. This is a fetish with these people. I mean, they're, they're crazy about it. At least on US campuses, you've got to recycle everything. You have 55 different slots. You put this here and that there. Let's suppose that plastic is as horrible as the, our friends on the left and the environmental movement think it is. It's uh, noxious. It's uh, a poison. It's just very bad. Whereas paper is great. Paper bags are great because they're biodegradable and you put them in the earth and they be, uh, transform into earth in a couple of years. And I'm going to put you through two scenarios. The first one is you're at the supermarket checkout counter and they've rung up your groceries and they ask you this inevitable fateful question, paper or plastic? Now in most places, or it used to be in groceries, they wouldn't explicitly charge you for it. Uh, the, any more than they would charge you for the lighting or for the cleaning the, uh, uh, the, the hallways or anything like that. But let's suppose that they charged you a penny each. Do you now have any incentive to eschew the evil plastic and embrace the good paper? No, because it's a penny versus a penny. But there are more costs to paper and plastic bags than the cost of production. There's also the cost of disposal. Well, in most cases, uh, you're not led as if by Adam Smith's invisible hand to do the right thing either, namely get uh, not use the plastic and use the paper, because uh, they municipalized or nationalized the garbage dumps. And you usually pay for garbage removal by, through taxes, so it doesn't matter. But that's the problem. Suppose now that we privatized uh, garbage dumps, we privatized uh, uh, waste disposal areas, and let's suppose, again, that paper is good and plastic is bad. If you own a garbage dump, would you allow plastic in your garbage dump, even though if you had plastic there, you couldn't use it for farming because it would be poisonous, you couldn't build on it uh, because it would be poisonous, would you allow it? At the right price, yeah. So let's suppose that the harm done by the environment to, to the environment or to your private property is $5 per plastic bag. What will the market price of disposing of a plastic bag be? It'll probably be $5, because if it was more, someone would undercut it. And if it was less, the people would lose money. Well, now you're back at the supermarket checkout counter, and instead of a penny versus a penny, it's 501 versus two cents. Yes, it's a penny to buy either of them, but it's $5 to dispose of the plastic for a total of 501 versus a penny to dispose of the paper for a grand total of two cents. Now the invisible hand is working. Now you're being led to use the good environmental thing, namely paper and not plastic, because now the market is allowed to work. The reason the market wasn't allowed to work before is because they municipalized, they, the government took over the garbage dumps and didn't charge a price that reflected the true harm to the environment. Now there is this guy, Rathje, R-A-T-H-J-E, who was a garbologist. Not kidding, there is such a thing as a garbologist. He's a guy who uh, analyzes garbage. <laughs> I mean, nobody grows up what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a garbologist, but you know nobody grows up being wanting to be a proctologist either, so uh, it all works out in the end. And according to Rathje, <laughs> according to Rathje, the very opposite is the case. Plastic is inert. Paper is bad. Uh, paper, uh, especially uh, telephone books that they used to have before, electronic, uh, creates methane gas and stuff. Okay, well, if that's true, then the market will work the other way, to penalize paper and to support plastic. Whatever... Uh, the reality is the market will tend in that direction because if they don't, they'll lose money. Will they do it perfectly? No, but they'll do it better than government because when government makes a mistake, and they do make mistakes too, they're humans. That's a big concession on my part, but I'm willing to make it just for argument's sake. Uh, th there is no weeding out process that Hazlitt uh, talks about in his book Economics in One Lesson. By the way, somebody during the break asked me what books do I recommend to get into this libertarian Austrian stuff? And the two books that converted me are Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand and Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt. 
The other two books I would recommend are both by Rothbard, For New Liberty and The Ethics of Liberty. And those four books would be a good start. Don't start with Man, Economy, and State or Human Action. It's heavy stuff. You have to get in the water, put your toe in the water. Okay, the next one is overpopulation. I was at a, a debate with um, an opponent, not unlike with Steve, although on a different topic, and he was saying that we have an overpopulation problem, and I said, there he is, he's ready to come up on stage, uh, and he's gonna tell you we have too many people. He has it within his power to reduce the size of the population by one. <laughs> and the fact that he's standing there shows that he didn't avail himself of this, so how can you trust him if he doesn't even believe in his own crappy theory? <laughs> And I got booed and uh, hissed because it was a very hostile audience. So this audience isn't hostile at all. Uh, thank you for that. But this is a very hostile campus audience. Oh, boo, boo, you know, you're evil for, you know, saying bad things about this other guy. Look, uh, there is no overpopulation problem. Uh, Malthus uh, said there was, and there was this uh, subsistence level where you can just uh, support the human being, and every time we had more than a population than the subsistence level would uh, 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 support, um, we would have war or pestilence or famine or something, and then when we, uh, if we went below the, the level of population that would be supported by um, uh, subsistence, then people could have kids and we'd get up to it. So it was sort of like a, a, an oscillation around the, the, the normal curve of whatever subsistence level is. This is wrong, and we can prove it wrong based on the existence of slavery. Now, follow what I'm trying to say. Suppose it were true that people uh, could only uh, produce enough income or wealth just to, for mere subsistence. How much would you pay for a slave like that? Nothing, right? Now look, I'm not supporting slavery. I'm just using it as an analytic technique to show that Malthus and all Malthusians are wrong about overpopulation and, and this subsistence level nonsense. Because if slaves could only produce enough to support themselves and no more, there'd be no sense in buying one or hunting down one and capturing him because he couldn't produce anything for you. But we've had slavery throughout all recorded history and probably before all recorded history. Therefore, throughout all recorded history and probably before, Malthus was wrong. Uh, Thomas Sowell, a favorite economist of mine, even though he was a Chicagoan warmonger, but he was good on some things, said that uh, in order to put this population in, in context, he said, suppose you take all seven billion people on this earth and you put them in the form of middle class houses, two story, 25 foot square houses with a front yard and a backyard, and that's all you did. You had no roads, no, uh, no um, uh, mines, no uh, parks, no nothing. Just people in houses. How big a place would you have to have in order to have uh, 7 billion people living? And the answer is Texas. Now, Texas is a big state, but it's, you know, on the world scale, it's pretty small. And yet, you can get all 7 billion people in there. So he's trying to show that we don't have that many people. Another uh, way I like to illustrate this is, I don't know about you younger people, nowadays you have this body surfing thing where you stand in a crowd and you put somebody above you and you move them around with your hands. In my day, when men were men <laughs> and, and sheep were fearful, no, no, that's <laughs> that, 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 scratch that, ignore that. <laughs> when men were men, what we had was telephone booth stuffing contests. Now, you people don't know what a telephone booth is. It's a thing that you, it's about, I don't know, two, three feet long and feet, three, three deep and six feet high, and you stand in, you close the door, and you make a telephone call. And the idea was to stuff as many people as you could into the telephone booth. Don't ask. <laughs> it just makes as much sense as body surfing. Uh, don't knock it until you've tried it. <clears throat> Well, what size telephone booth would we need to get all seven billion of us in it? Assuming, I don't know, the average height, I'm about the average height, 5'8", and I don't know, I'm about maybe 10 inches thick and maybe 30 inches wide, and, uh, and I just stand there. Sorry. I shouldn't wave my hands around so much. Maybe I should, I don't know.
The size telephone booth that you need to put all seven billion people in is one mile cubic. Now, it would get to smell after about five seconds, and I'm, I'm not advocating it, but to just show how many people we've got. Uh, we have land that is unused. I mean, the Rocky Mountains, I mean, most of Australia isn't inhabited. Uh, it's only inhabited in the south uh, part, and similar with most countries. Uh, the people live in cities, and the countryside or the deserts are pretty empty. We've got room for many, many more people. Uh, and if we have these uh, population controls, we'll miss out on the next Mozart or the next Einstein or the next whoever um, rap music guy who is going to... I don't know who, uh, who it is. Um, Snoop Doggy Doggy. <laughs> uh, let me uh, try uh, two more. Environmental racism and then trees. What's environmental racism? Environmental... It's, Environmental racism is people locate bad environmental things like uh, airports that, that have noise or pig farms or something in, in black areas uh, because black people are not well organized, they're not rich, they're not going to be able to have as good a lawyer or whatever to stop it. And I would say that that type of environmental racism is problematic because you're initiating aggression against weak people. But there's a very different kind of environmental racism, and that's the idea that if you have a place, say an airport, that homesteaded the noise rights first, remember the Lockean homesteading theory? If the airport is there first, and the airport is only one square mile, and it makes noise in nine square miles, but it was there first before the people were there, and then somebody comes in, it's called coming to the nuisance, and you really can't sue them because they were there first homesteading the noise, which is why the supersonic airplane didn't go and it shouldn't have because uh, they only homesteaded a certain amount of noise and the supersonic was much noisier. Okay, so if you uh, locate something there and you're there first and it's either a bad smell or a noise or a little bit of pollution that is justified by homesteading, what happens to the land values? Well, the land values are lower, ceteris paribus, than they otherwise would have been had there not been this environmental disamenity and who will take advantage of lower real estate values, black people or poor people? It's really not environmental racism. It's more environmental povertyism. It's just that blacks and poor are correlated. So it seems as if it's an environmental racist issue. Uh, that would be justified. I mean, if, if they want to, or, or take a garbage dump. A garbage dump isn't nice to be next to, but the land values around the garbage dump will be lower than places without a garbage dump ceteris paribus, uh, so that would be justified in, in the libertarian view. Okay, the last one I'll deal with and then we'll have discussion. Maybe we can talk about global warming or other things like that. Uh, trees uh, and clear cutting. You know what clear cutting is? You take two big um, heavy um, tractors and you take a chain and the, each link is 300 pounds or, you know, real big chain. I'm not talking a chain like a necklace that a woman will wear. And you just go down the forest and you knock down all the trees. And for some reason, this really gets in the craw of our friends, the watermelon. They think this is the worst thing that has ever happened. There was a movie, Medicine Man with Sean Connery, where he found some sort of cure for MS or cancer or something in the Bolivian rainforest. And yet there were these... Uh, uh, clear cutters coming closer and closer and going to knock down the trees out of which he uh, had this cure for this disease. Look, if a private company did this and just left it there, it would ruin its present discounted value of, of its land. It wouldn't do that. And if it did do it, it would lose money and other people would take over the forest. Nothing wrong with clear cutting. They clear cut corn, they clear cut wheat, they clear cut things. You just replant. But what's happening in the Bolivian rainforest, and by the way, there are more species near the equator than further away from the equator. Uh, there was a sort of a spat between Argentina and Brazil as to who was the more macho, and the way macho was defined is who had better cattle ranches, don't ask. Argentina. Ar Argentina, oh. Ar Argentina was better. <laughs> And what happened was Argentina was better, so what the Brazilians did is they uh, had subsidies for cattle ranches in the Bolivian rainforest. And now the, you had private people cutting down the rainforest, but it was because of the subsidies from the Brazilian government. So again, 
whenever you see an environmental problem, there's going to be a government somewhere in the background uh, creating it. OK, I've covered not the entire waterfront, but I've discussed a few things. And to summarize, a free market environmentalism says that if you adhere to private property rights, you will, to that extent, favor the environment. And therefore, all of these left-wing environmentalists, if they really favored the environment, which they don't, what they really favor is busybodying it up. But if they really favored the environment, they would embrace free enterprise and capitalism and markets. Uh, do you want to send out the... Um, Thank you. Um, Walter, I must say that you'd have trouble dragging a chain through an Australian eucalypt forest and knocking the trees over. As a sawmill, that's not how it's done. <laughs> um, but that's beside the point. What I want to ask you about is water. I think the problem, I agree with you about the property rights solution to um, many environmental problems, but there's dispute over the property rights. So take an example of water. You'd, you'd understand this being from the States, and in Australia, people understand it. You've got a river. That, flows through three or four or five states in a federation. Um, does the water belong to the farmer that the rain falls on? Does it belong to the guy downstream who might want, or down land who might want underground water? Does it belong to every farmer along the river? So um, in that case, you do need a political solution. You could have war. But that's probably not the best solution. That's what people used to do. So uh, you had this problem in the States with your rivers as well. So we share the same thing. So what's your view on, on water and who owns that water? Let's pretend governments don't exist. Let's pretend it's all farmers. But who actually owns the water? Um, and at what point? My motto is if it moves, privatise it. If it doesn't move, privatise it. And since everything either moves or doesn't move, you privatize everything, including water. Now, in my lecture on privatizing roads, I was going to do a little bit about privatizing rivers and oceans. But since you ask, I'll, I'll discuss it now. The problem you have with, uh, with uh, whales being uh, overfished is that the oceans are not owned. If the oceans were owned, people would make more rational decisions. Some people say that the oceans are becoming too acidified. Similarly, if I owned a part of the ocean and you were acidifying it, I would sue you and stop you from doing it. Uh, we have a Mississippi River in, in the US, which uh, goes from, I don't know, the Canadian border, a few tributaries right by me in, in um, uh, New Orleans. Um, if it were owned privately, uh, the Army Corps, you know, the Army Corps of Engineers and FEMA between them killed 1,900 people in New Orleans uh, after the aftermath of um, uh, that storm, uh, Katrina. Uh, they didn't put good uh, levees in there, and, and people are now uh, having on their bumper sticker, make levees, not war, <laughs> instead of make love, not war. It's supposed to be a joke, but it didn't do too well. <laughs> <laughs> can't, can't win them all. Uh, if you had a Mississippi River Corporation that owned the Mississippi River and was liable for damages to the uh, uh, passers-by or the, the neighbors, then I expect better results, not perfect results given the human condition, but better results because whenever you privatize something, if you do a good job, you make more profits and you can expand your base of operation. If you do a bad job, somebody else is going to buy you out and, and you're going to lose money. Now, who should own the Mississippi River is, is a very difficult question. Uh, the, if you go back to Locke, John Locke and Murray Rothbard, it's the people who mix their labor with the, the river. That might be uh, maybe all the people on the sides of the Mississippi River, which might be 100,000 people for all I know. Uh, maybe all the people that had boats running up and down the Mississippi River with cargo boats and stuff like that. Right now, the problem is that the Army Corps of Engineers is going to lower the water level which will screw up the boats but help something else. Well, you know, we always have that problem on the land. As far as I'm concerned, uh, water is just fast moving land and land is slow moving water. It's the same thing and you gotta privatize it all. Now, it's difficult at this point to say who should own the Mississippi River, just as it would be difficult to say who should own the, the road that goes by this hotel. 
The homesteading answer would be the people that used it. Or if we had the God's eye view, we'd figure out which taxes came from which people to build that road. And, and we'd make a stock company with shares based on how much of your money went into that road. You can't do it with rivers, but certain people have put money into levees, private people. Uh, there are boat owners, and you get them all together. And look, this is the problem that the Soviet Union faced when they had uh, collectivized farms and, and a steel f uh, factory that was uh, nationalized. And now they want to get out of nationalization. Uh, I spend my summers in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, and there was this company called BR, BCRIC, BRIC, British Columbia Resources Investment Corporation, which had a whole bunch of... Um, lumber mills and farms and mines and stuff, and the previous NDP government was voted out and the conservatives wanted to privatize it. So what they did is they made a new company called Brick Incorporated, and they gave five shares in this company to every resident of uh, British Columbia. Well, it's not exactly right, but what the heck? We could do the same thing with the Mississippi River. We could do the same thing with the oceans. I mean, it sounds weird. You know, it sounds like there's something in these cough drops more than <laughs> cough drops, but, but if you want to apply this, see, I guess my thing in, in economics or political philosophy is to take just ordinary things and apply it to areas that hitherto it hasn't been applied to. And water is certainly one example of that. I mean, should the, the lake be for fishing or boating or swimming or as a garbage dump? I mean, some lakes might be garbage dumps for all I know. Well, it depends on the prices. And if we have prices, we'll know which is the best land use uh, of any particular thing. Should we build high rises in Central Park in New York City? I don't know, but if somebody owned Central Park, they would make a better decision than the government, I think. So I would apply this principle of privatization to everything. Not air, because air is not a good. Air is not a scarce good. When you run a marathon, at the end of the marathon, you're going like this. <laughs> Nobody comes up to you and says, hey, you know, you're breathing too much. Whereas on the moon or on Mars, when we get there one day, if we don't blow ourselves up before then, these will be goods and we'll have to privatize oxygen or air. Nothing wrong with that. It's the way the market works. Uh, Thank you. I just want to go back to the Mississippi example of it being privately owned. Uh, imagine a situation, say, 1840, there are no railways, but there's one footbridge that goes over the Mississippi River that's already in existence, and there's a corporation that owns the Mississippi River. Then we have a new technology that comes along called railways. The footbridge is not capable of taking a train. So I guess uh, my question is, how do we meet, how would we get the uh, trains across the Mississippi? I mean, they could ultimately buy the bridge um, and if this didn't interfere with the Mississippi Corporation's ownership rights, if they could maybe buy the bridge either side, buy the land that the current bridge is on and upgrade it, or how would they get a new bridge if that was not possible for technical reasons, how would they get the railway line over the bridge, uh, over the river? The, uh, right. Uh, this really is a question that I had planned to deal with tomorrow when I talked about privatising highways. I was going to talk about the holdout problem. You want to build a, a road from where are we, Sydney to Perth? across all of uh, Australia. And I don't know how many people own the land between here and there, but several hundred thousand maybe. And suppose there's one holdout who says, uh, sure, you can build uh, your, your uh, road on my land, but it'll cost you $7 trillion. Namely, you're not building over my land. Uh, there is a thing called the uh, ad colum doctrine, A-D-C-O-E-L-U-M. And this is the doctrine that says if you own a patch of the earth, say a, a square mile, then you own a cone down to the core of the earth, and then you own up into the heavens. So therefore, uh, if you own that square mile of land and I want to put a, a road or a railroad or a bridge or whatever it is, I can't tunnel under or bridge over because you own down here and you own up there. But the ad column doctrine I'm really taking a lot of what I was going to say. I'll, I'll think of something else to say on that other lecture. I'm on a hot streak now. I'm not going to stop. Uh, the ad colum doctrine is incompatible with libertarianism. Because the ad colum doctrine says you own stuff down to the core of the earth, which is 4,500 miles down, and you never homesteaded anywhere near there. And also it would play havoc with airplanes because you own up into the heavens, and every time somebody comes by at 35,000 feet, you can charge them. 
You never homesteaded that. If anyone homesteaded, it's the airlines or the miners. So now you can have this thing called slant drilling where you go down and across and under your neighbor and you grab his oil or you grab whatever. Perfectly legitimate, you were there first. So the answer, I think, uh, to the, whether it's a holdout for a highway or the river is privately owned and you want it, you bridge right over it. Uh, the owner of the uh, river mainly owns up as high as the highest boat that goes on the Mississippi, which say is, I don't know, 100 feet high or whatever it is. Okay, so you build, you build it 200 feet high and you can get right over his water. Uh, easier if he agreed, but if he doesn't agree, then you just go over him or I don't know if you can go under the Mississippi. I don't know how deep it is, but that would be my rough answer to that. Uh, I guess just a follow-on question from that with the Ad Column Doctrine then, if you are home, only homesteading the surface, um, how does that impact mineral rights? For example, if you, own, if you are homesteading and own a piece of land and strike something, like is anybody entitled to then dig under and... I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Um, so if adding, owning what's under the ground is incompatible with libertarianism, um, let's say you were homesteading and so you're suggesting that you just own the surface of the land? Ah. So if you, do you own mining rights then for what's under there or the mineral rights or can anybody just come along and dig under your property no, no. and take what's there? The, the rule is you own uh, only so far, uh, the other guy can come under you so as long as he doesn't cave in your buildings. Now if you're a farmer and all you have is wheat farm, the, the wheat plants, the roots go only, I don't know, two feet deep so you can go three feet deep. If you have a tree, the, the branches of the tree go way deeper, say 100 feet so you can go under the tree. If you have uh, the Empire State Building, which has got five stories underground, you can go under it, but you have to go under it far enough so that you don't cave them in. Now, if it's built in Manhattan, which is a solid rock, you can get pretty close. If it's built like New Orleans, which is a swamp, you have to go way, way down, otherwise you'll uh, cave in their buildings. So that would be the rule. Uh, I once was in a debate with somebody, he called me a G-man, government man, because I'm making these rules. He, he thinks that only government can make rules, that rules can't come from the logic of homesteading, which I think they can. Obviously, if you're going to cave in my buildings, you came too close under me. But if you didn't, and I never went down there, you can go under me. So I don't own the mineral rights unless I've been mining down there. And if I've been mining down to a half mile and you go down a whole mile, you're okay. So that would be the rule. You can't interfere with the other guy's enjoyment of his property, and that would depend upon what he's doing and how solid rock-ish the earth is, or is it a swampish kind of a place. Hi. Um, just uh, in Australia, there's um, an Aboriginal culture that, uh, to the best of my understanding, doesn't seem to uh, recognize private property rights in the way that our culture does. Um, what is the solution towards cooperating in different cultures in such a way where one culture doesn't quite recognize uh, private property rights that another culture does? Uh, everyone hears all these questions? Okay. Uh, I don't, really don't know much about the Aboriginals, but let me talk about the native Indians of the US, which I suppose is vaguely analogous. Uh, the Indians in North America also didn't have a culture of private property rights, but there were treaties that the government made with them, and then they would discover oil on this land, they kick them off, and then they discover something else on their next reservation, they kick them off there. Well, at the very least, the, the government should be held, have its feet held to the fire, and at least uphold its contracts or its treaties with these uh, groups. On the other hand, if, if we abstract from that problem, and, and these uh, native peoples don't really have a concept of private property rights, well, like the Indian tribes, they would have a northern <clears throat> setting and then a southern setting. And in the winter, they'd go south. And in the, the summer, they'd go north, of maybe to Montana, to um, Arizona. Uh, well, they certainly own the, uh, the, the road between the two because they transvested or they, they walked on it or rode on it. And they certainly own a few square miles up here and a few square miles down there, even though they don't have any concept of it. 
And one of the problems with the uh, native peoples in Canada and the US is, uh, we were talking about collectivism before, here we had coercive collectivism, forced collectivism. If an Indian tribe leaves, and if an Indian person leaves the tribal area, he can't take his property with him. So they're sort of stuck there, and then they, they have uh, coercive socialism on the reservations. So I don't think that the big problem, at least in North America, is with, um, uh, is with property rights. It's rather that they are forced by the government into this socialistic type of existence. And if they would just divide up the reservations, uh, if there were 300 Indians and they divided into, and they had uh, 300 acres or 300 square miles, and each one got a square mile, they would do much better than the other way. And if they wanted to amalgamate, that's fine. But they're not given the choice. It's a coercive amalgamation. It's a coercive collectivism. And that, I think, is the, the source of the problem there. But unfortunately, I don't really know that much about the aboriginals, so I'm just extrapolating from what I do know or a little bit about what I know. Oh, hi. Um, I had a question, I guess, that's directed around uh, diffuse source pollution or non-point source pollution. So I'll use an example. We're seeing the Great Barrier Reef and uh, uh, on the, you know, all across the land of Queensland, there might be uh, farming, beef farming or industry or cane farming, and each of them are contributing to uh, a pollution of different types that's impacting on the Barrier Reef. In this situation, it's very difficult to actually determine how much of the problem is attributable to each of the individual players. How, under, how might we address this issue under a private properties uh, approach? Well, I think I sort of touched upon this when I talked about are you going to sue each and every individual automobile owner? Because the problem is, one, there are so many of them, and two, each of them uh, contributes such a minuscule amount of pollution that it's almost impossible to really sue them. Uh, so this is, is a problem, and the answer to that was privatize the highways. Um, I'm not sure I, I fully understand the Great Barrier Reef. Again, my geographical ignorance uh, comes up to the fore. But if someone owned the ocean, if there was this ocean incorporated and, and there were hundreds of people putting bad stuff in the water that ruined the reef, well, I guess... This would be a problem if each one of them did so little that it was indiscernible. But if there were some bigger ones, you'd go after them and say, you know, you can't do that. Uh, you go to court, and if the court upholds private property rights in oceans, which it's not bloody likely to do, but if it did, then you'd have some sort of um, a solution to the problem. A perfect solution, no, because this is a, an intractable problem. When millions of people do just a, a teensy weensy little amount of harm, that's very, very difficult. Uh, but usually, uh, there are ways to amalgamate it. The, the way to do it with roads, uh, with cars, is ownership of roads. I'm not sure how it would work in um, oceans, but um, I, I guess the, the only answer that comes to my mind is you go after the big guys, or the, what is it, the low-hanging fruit first, and then you go after other people, and then people get the idea. Or perhaps some of them become owners of the ocean, because they're right on the land. And the reason that they're polluting the ocean is because they don't own the ocean. But if they all together was a corporation of Ocean Incorporated, and that corporation would say, hey, look, we're, we're um, defecating in our own pot or something like that, and we've got to cut it out if we want to maximize the value of both the land and the water. You know, one of the problems in Louisiana, according to one of my buddies, is that we're losing four football fields of land every day to the ocean. And my question is, well, is this good or bad? It depends upon the price of the water and the price of the land. But we have no price of the water because we don't have any market in the water. It's the same thing with the, uh, what do you call it, those um, windmills that, that create electricity and kill birds. Well, is this good or bad? We don't have prices. Uh, we solve these problems every day in, in ordinary, uh, you know, should we have a shirt or should we have yellow dye or blue dye or whatever? We solve these problems every day in the market, but we don't have a market in these environmental amenities. So the free market environmental answer is make a market in them and then let the market work. The market works everywhere else. Why wouldn't it work here? Uh, we have time for one more question. Uh, I'm going just down the back corner. Just 
just to change the subject slightly, something you said earlier today um, worries me a bit. Um, you said you're in favour of the concept of somebody being able to sell themselves into slavery. Yes. How does that uh, equate to the concept of self-ownership and how would you enforce it? Um, what if somebody sold himself into slavery and then said, uh, I'm not going to uh, abide by this uh, contract? Uh, what's the consequences? Well, um, I, I do want to answer one other question because somebody came to me during the break and asked me something about the, um, the what, what do you want to call it, the um, sociobiology. So I hope you'll indulge me to answer that one as well. Okay, suppose I sold myself into slavery to you and now you didn't like the cut of my jib or you didn't like the way I did the, the host of, what is it, haul that, pull that barge, whatever. I didn't do a good job and you started whipping me. And then I called the cops and I said, hey, assault and battery. And the cops would say to me, not assault and battery because it's part of the slave contract th that you can whip me. So that would be the answer. I mean, if I'm your slave and I agree to be your slave, th there's no backsies or you know, changing your mind or anything like that. I'm your slave. And it, it, it depends upon the contract. Can you torture me? Can you not torture me? Can you kill me, not kill me? Whatever the contract says. And if the contract says you can whip me for being snarky, well, then you can whip me. And when I call the police, the police will support you. That's what voluntary slavery means. Now, the, the question on... on um, Sociobiology, uh, I forget who it was, uh, a gentleman there, uh, said to me, but in the old days, tribes did trade. And what happened is I have a, a colleague, one of the um, colleagues of mine in the economics department, a guy named John Lavendis, and he was telling me the exact same thing. And he said, uh, they've discovered caveman dwellings where they had 5,000 pots, even though the tribe was 200. And over here, they had 4,000 spears, even though the tribe was 100. And from this, we intuit that they were trading because you're not going to make that many pots that you don't need. So there was trade. So we picked up a third co-author on this paper. And what this guy said is, you're both right. It's true that we are hardwired uh, more for direct benevolence than for indirect market benevolence. But uh, with regard to trade, it's true that we traded when we were cavemen, but we didn't trade as mammals. In other words, we're more hardwired for benevolence. The mother deer helps the baby deer, and deers help each other to stop the wolves. In other words, the hardwiredness goes, uh, the more hardwired, the further back it goes. And mammals have benevolence, not uh, amphibians, but mammals do have benevolence. They help each other. So the solution to that problem, we now picked on this guy as our third co-author, is that yes, we are hardwired for trade, but only superficially. We're much more deeply hardwired for benevolence because there we go way back to us as mammals, not just as cavemen. Thanks for your attention.